what I'm uh, going to talk about today it might sound a bit pompous, but it's actually an attempt to answer the question that so many people have been asking in recent in these recent few years. So what happened, or rather what has happened and is still happening in Hungary and Poland? There were many ideas about to how this thing could be uh, characterized. So there is idea of, an idea of democratic backsliding, uh, for, for example, by Wojciech Sadurski. Hi, Kaz. <laughs> there is the idea of populist constitutionalism being on its way, the idea that's promoted, for example, by Paul Blocker, currently of Bologna. There is this notion of illiberal democracy and also unconventional democracy promoted by Adam Czarnota. And of course, the discussion of failed transformation or even failed democracy is also very much on the run, especially in the more popular uh, discourses. What I'm going to give you today is largely a summary of my research published uh, bits, odds, bits and ends various odds of what I'm going to uh, say today are published in all these papers, but mostly in the book of uh, 2015, this is the theoretical part, but I have the feeling that I have been writing mostly about Polish constitutional crisis these three years, so I'm a bit uh, tired with the problem, to be frank. So I'm going to outline my argument as follow. I will first give you my idea of a figurational sociology of law, in four points. Then I will give you in one point the idea of the consequences for the rule of law to be drawn from this figurational sociology of law as I imagine it is it, it is a figurational sociology of law because there are many other approaches to law that could be taken that would still remain within the Elysian tradition the way I understand it. And then I will offer you some guidelines for a case study of uh, uh, European integration based on the cases of Hungary and Poland. But this will be only guidelines, not a very detailed description of what has been happening in these two countries. So first, the theoretical part. Uh, there are, uh, and we had the discussion uh, uh, today only in the morning session there is always this question why Norbert Elias did not really pay much attention to the law. Whether he neglected the law completely or he only challenged some well-established ideas about the law, whether he neglected the German tradition of treating the law as one of the main objects of sociological research or he just reinterpreted this tradition creatively, these are matters of great interest to me but I will not discuss them now. What I'm offering here is my idea of how what Elias wrote about the law can be put into something which I like to imagine could be a consistent theoretical approach. And there are four aspects to this approach. First, there is this distinction of moral laws and game rules, which I find incredibly important and fascinating. There is the problem of transparency and latency of the law directly connected to the first point, to this distinction between moral laws and game rules. Then there is the issue of habitus dependence of legal norms, which is of course the point in which history comes to the fore in this research. And then there is something uh, which I'm only now slowly commencing to do, integrating Elias's symbol theory into sociology of law in the points of language, memory, and fantasy or fantasizing or fiction. And in this company, I guess you should never move around without citing chapter and verse. So here are the, the words of the classic, uh, or two classics in this case. The distinction between the moral law and game rule types of norms. Elias and Dunning, in a Leisure in Spare Time Spectrum, insist that the sociological approach to normativity or to norms is basically flawed because it does not really pay it <laughs> sorry I'm just moving here it does not really uh, pay enough attention to the fact that there are two distinct ways in which people are thinking about norms all norms and legal norms are also norms of course 
So there are these norms which are imagined like uh, moral laws. There are the moral law types of norms. They appear, and all these red markings are mine, all these highlights, of course. They appear not to be bound by a specific figuration. One does not ask how they originate or whether they can change and develop, and if so, then why? They are perceived, again, as the spring and the fountainhead of social action, which, again, like one's conscience, seems to come from nowhere. Which, while causing people to cohere in societies, seem to be neither descended from nor dependent or anything else. And an example of such a norm is naturally something like, do shall not kill. This is a moral law. Nobody asks why and where and uh, whether and under what condition and with what reservations. Actually, we should ask these questions. We could ask these questions, and sociologists do ask these questions, but the so-called normal people don't. And there are other norms. There are these game rule kind of norms. The norms uh, whose social genesis is perfectly obvious to everyone. The example I'm using in my book is the offside rule. The offside rule as to to whom, if you pass the ball, in what way, and who's standing where at the moment the ball is kicked, then what happens? Everybody knows that it is an artificial rule, a conventional rule. It's been made in order to achieve certain effects in the game. Rules in sports game can be changed, can be made um, better or worse from the point of view of this leisure value of sports, of this sporting value of sports. And this is an example of game rules. But of course, sociologically speaking, all norms come from the society. So this word appear is really the crucial one. How does a certain norm appear to the people? And thus we <coughs> come to the point about transparency and latency of the law. It's a somewhat long quotation and I think we all more or less know that it comes from Elias, and it's about legal forms corresponding to the structure of society. Uh, these general legal norms, which are set down in writing, by the way, this is very important for Elias, that they are set down in writing, but I'm not, I, I'm not going to tackle that matter now. It presupposes a very high degree of social integration and formation of central institution with uh, monopoly of violence, etc. The power that backs up <coughs> legal <coughs> titles and property claims, and this is the civil law relevance of Elias, that's not really, that's virtually absent from the scholarship up until now, in modern times is no longer directly visible. No longer. Perhaps it was visible at the point, but now it's latent. It's there, the power, but it's, we can't see it. And therefore, in proportion to individuals, this power is so great that it is very seldom put to the test. Therefore, there is such a strong tendency to regard the law as something self-explanatory, as if it had down, come down from heaven, an absolute right, something which is in fact like the moral laws, not like game rules. But, of course, the laws do not come from heaven. And therefore, the habitus dependence of legal norms is of primary importance in understanding why people would ever really follow any legal norm. We say the power, of course, but it is a very old Weberian point. I mean, there is no power enough to force everyone to follow all the laws of the country. What really forces people to do that is, of course, the habitus. And under the rule of law, what Elias really says in this place in a, is in a pacified society, if I recall correctly, the constant testing of social power relations in physical struggles is replaced by a long enduring readiness to abide by the existing law. People just do that. Only when upheavals and tensions have become extraordinarily great, when interest in the preservation of the existing law has become uncertain, only then, says Elias, after intervals lasting centuries, do groups in a society begin to test whether the established law corresponds to actual social power relationships. Only I would correct this statement. Firstly, the intervals need not last centuries. In the case under Discussion Hill, the, intervals was the interval was merely 30 years, at the very best. 
Secondly, it need not be physical struggles. It may as just as well be other kinds of struggle, although the physical struggle would always be the, the extreme, the final, the borderline case in Elias's theory. And this readiness to abide by the existing law need not be that long enduring. What we are looking at, actually, in the case of post-socialist societies is the process of uh, creating this readiness to become a law-abiding society, to become a society whose habitus includes the tendency to abide by the law. And as Islin de Kuiper has put it very beautifully, habitus is congealed history. This brings me to the point about symbol theory and its link, its direct link to sociology of law. It is absorbed into our bodies and our personal history is shaped by the history of the society in which, of which we are a part. This larger history determines the ground tone of our individual history. So the question arises, how is history transmitted into habitus? How does it become the part of the habitus? And histories are transmitted, mediated, meddled with and changed, of course, and they are also changed by way of lawmaking, by way of legal practices. The documentary effect of law, and in particular of the positive law, as well as its mobilizing and manipulative aspect, is therefore directly related to the habitus and to the chances, to the odds of establishing a law-abiding mindset in a society. So, to put it very, very bluntly, the consequences for the rule of law of this theoretical model would be, first, to ask whose rule it is, really, because the law does never govern. Somebody governs by way of the rule of law. Then, what is its figurational correlate, so to say? What figurational conditions make it possible? Then, a part of what social process is the rule of, role, the rule of law really is, and what group dynamics support the rule of law or undermine it? These are perfectly straightforward questions, of course. And to give you one more very long and very beautiful quote from one of my uh, teachers, who is uh, sadly no longer with us, from uh, Jerzy Szatski, <coughs> who wrote in 1994, the translation went out a year later with CEU Press, significantly, uh, about the origins of actually also the rule of law in, uh, in post-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. What he said is as follows, in a certain sense, liberals, because they are the responsible, so to say, the actors of this transformation process, in the post-communist countries found themselves in a position similar to the decades earlier one of the communists who took up the task of building socialism. The communists had an ideological blueprint of the future in which they firmly believed, but nothing much else. Favoring this social design, the communist design still, were only theoretical arguments. According to these arguments, the practical implementation of this scheme was beneficial to society, although it is liberal now, and its majority in the long run, but was not consistent with the current interests of members of society initiated under real socialism. This is the habitus problem here. The liberals had incomparably greater social consent for their project, but they could not expect this support to last or deceive themselves that it was support given to liberalism as such. What we see in this very short quote is uh, an outline of a situation when we have liberals coming with a liberal utopia in order to transform the societies according to this utopian project they are applying what I call elsewhere liberal pedagogy in order to transform their societies and what we see now would be a reaction to this liberal pedagogy and an anti-liberal utopian movement. So the guidelines for a case study which I derive from my theoretical outline, would be first to perceive what is happening or has been happening in Hungary and Poland thus far as, uh, as debunking moral laws as game rules. What is happening is in fact debunking moral laws and game, as game rules. We are saying, okay, 
let's check it out. And it turns out, okay, rule of law is not something everybody believes in. It's not something everybody thinks is really, well, it's happening by itself. It's not a machine that would go by itself. This machine suddenly stops. Secondly, it's the idea of revising the rules of the game. That's what Viktor Orban did successfully in Hungary because he had a constitutional majority. What uh, Jarosław Kaczyński in Poland has not been able to achieve thus far, well, the elections are coming, the support for peace is still very high. Nevertheless, in both cases, there is this revision of the rules of the game, not only in the very simple sense of changing the law, it's also <laughs> fundamentally changing the way in which the laws are interpreted and understood. This, this quote from Viktor Orban, the nation cannot be the opposition. The guy has just lost the, ele uh, the election. He says, okay, I'm not going to be the opposition, nevertheless, because there is a different way of understanding my position. And the alternative way, uh, in comparison to what has been a part of legal interpretation up until now and constitutional practice. There are further on the dialectics of the transparent and the latent, and these dialectics are best observed in the very practice of lawmaking. Most of the laws which have been, um, well, maybe not most, that would be, I, I would need to check on that, but uh, certainly all the important laws in the domain of constitutional law that have been made in Poland after 2015 were made in the middle of the night. None of them were made by daylight. It just didn't, didn't happen. There are many explanations of that. Nevertheless, it's certainly not a transparent practice. The, the nation wakes up to a new legal order in the morning and needs to catch up with the legal order. There is also this practice, and it is common to Hungary and Poland and some other countries, of amending the laws, constantly amending them. So one law is being passed and an amendment is already being processed. So you get as many as five or ten amendments to very important basic acts that are mining the institutional structure of the state in a year. Nobody can catch up with that. That's also an aspect of the latency, only used in order to introduce what I would call a decivilizing legal practice. Then there is a very strong focus on designing the national habitus as part of legal philosophy. This focus of what we really are as Poles or as Hungarians, what we are essentially. This focus is becoming a part of the lawmaking as a, a basic fundamental idea of why the laws are made. And I have examined it not only in the field of constitutional law, where it is pretty obvious because this social identity, collective identity function of the constitutions is really like stock in trade of constitutional law. I have also examined it on, the, on other examples like hunting laws in Poland, for example. Quite funny, the way national habitus is construed around the marginal practice which is hunting in this country. A part of designing the national habitus is also a very intensive memory work or both these regimes. Some of you might have followed the discussion around the memory law passed by Polish parliament on denying, uh, or rather not denying, the, on uh, allegations regarding Polish participation in the Shoah. This is a w but one example, you have to take my word for that, of very intensive memory work, uh, something which I call commemorative lawmaking. All lawmaking is in fact part of commemorating those aspects of national past which are to become uh, an element of national habitus. And of course there is this rise in politics of exclusion that has been discussed in this conference in the context of refugee crisis and the dynamics of established and outsiders <laughs> translate, in my opinion, directly into a clash of two utopias. One of them would be the liberal utopia, and the other one would be the conservative one represented by the current government under the uh, heading of what has been called also conservative revolution. And I know one shouldn't do that, and it's not <coughs> a good sociological practice to just offer an illustration. A visual should never be an illustration in sociology, but it is. These are two posters, uh, both of them pertain to the current constitutional crisis. To your left, you see a poster that comes from the official site of the Polish president, 
Mr. Andrzej, uh, Andrzej Duda. And to your right, you see a poster that's being used by the opposition during demonstrations and all sorts of anti-governmental uh, rallies and meetings and so on. What these two demonstrate is, in my opinion, exactly the clash of two visions of collectivity, two visions of collective identity, and two utopias of Polishness, in this case because it only comes from Poland. Hungarian visuals are a bit different, featuring Viktor Orban very much as a strong power figure. Well, the Polish strong power figure, Jarosław Kaczyński, is not <coughs> probably that presentable, so maybe that's the reason why. <laughs> anyway, here, no, I, I think it's really an objective reason for that, simply. So uh, the left one says, reads in Polish, together about the constitution. It's an encouragement to take part in the discussion. And you see, well, there is Poland in there, made of dots. There are people in Poland, but these people are just dots. And what is really important is Poland in its very political, national, international shape with the borderlines. Uh, that's the subject matter of this paper that I've written recently for historical social research when I examined the role of Catholic religion in this kind of imagery. Quite fascinating. I might come to that in the discussion if you like. What you see here is a quintessence of liberalism, if you like. So it reads constitution. The T-Y is you in Polish, the white letters, and the red letters are I or me. Yeah. So this is constitution is something between you and I, and I particularly love it because these are personal pronouns, and to every Liesian, personal pronouns are very dear. But nevertheless, there is no emergence. There is no synergy effect, nothing. Constitution is something interactional. But what happens to Poland? What happens to collectivity? There is no idea of that it's purely individualistic. That's my reading of it. Of course, there are many alternative possibilities to read those two. Nevertheless, what this clash symbolizes is also a kind of um, void that we might accept, a chasm that we might accept after Europe. And of course, I'm using the title of Ivan Krasiv's very provoking and brilliant essay. This would be, to quote Sadursky, the end of this comfortable illusion of the communality of political and legal cultures of the members of the EU and new members recruited from within <coughs> Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe should be, which created a sense of confidence in, and pass, uh, watch out now, proper behavior of member states. It's all about behaving and misbehaving. The new states like Poland and Hungary, they are not behaving properly. So the legal <coughs> standards, the habitus, and the, the good manners somehow converged in this question. And one last question in this talk would be whether we should worry about or not. Not as citizens, not as Hungarians or Polish people or Europeans or citizens of the world or anyway, as sociologists. And as Liazian sociologist, I should say there is one reason why we should worry, and this is the reason related to what will happen if the societies and states do not behave. And, you know, there is this thing, well, always when I'm speaking English, I have this inclination to pack some classical quotation into what I am speaking. I don't know why. In Polish, I never have, I'm never tempted to do so. So this is the classical quotation which with I, I would like to conclude this talk. And it comes from the very um, dramatic moment of the Peloponnesian War. You might call it that there is this problem with Mytilene and Mytilene uh, uh, rebels against Athens and there is this Mytilenean debate and they must decide what to do with these rebels. There is this huge debate in which what might be called the quintessential characteristics of populism are, populism are being diagnosed by Thucydides. And the quote reads as follows. In my opinion, the two things most adverse to good counsel are haste and passion. Former is the mark of folly, the latter of vulgarity and narrowness of mind. When a man insists that words ought not to be our guides in action, and laws are made of words, essentially, he is either wanting in sense or in honesty. And he goes on and on. This is Eucrates, no, Diodotus, son of Eucrates. 
And so the city suffers, he concludes, for she is robbed of her counselors by <coughs> fear. If countries do not behave, if they cannot really be uh, made to behave, the alternative is that, that will be, they will be guided by something else than good manners. They will be guided by fear. They will be guided by all these emotions which tend to spiral down and put us in all these double binds that we very well know from involvement and detachment. But there is one other risk in all that. This is a description of populism, but this is also a description of a reaction, or rather an expression of a reaction to populism. This is a reaction in which there is also plenty of passion. And passion is dangerous. Passion is dangerous for scientific research. So this situation really makes us look at the rule of law and the crisis of the rule of law in post-socialist countries. This is my subject, but there are many other subjects of the kind in the world, perhaps with more passion than is good for us as scientists. So there is also a double kind of warning in this situation. One warning is about the figurational aspect of the rule of law, and the other warning is about what we do when we are already aware of it. Thank you. said that uh, made the, that um, law is sometimes uh, understood as pistol upon man by heaven. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I, I, I think pretty much everybody, everybody here agrees in the, that, that it's not true and that it's actually socially oriented, etc. But it, my, my question is, do we know why, do, why law is thought in this way? Like pistol mm -hmm. upon man? Why, why people tend to do it. Why, why mm -hmm. this, right. Why does this exist, this, this need to, uh, to understand law like a uh, mm -hmm. Well, part of it, uh, part of the answer is already provided by Elias just in this quote, for example. So if you have a stable, uh, this is like, this is a German <coughs> person speaking. This is very important. So this, this idea of a very stable, legal system that exists and can only change within itself and according to its own rule, the idea that really culminates in the legal theory of Niklas Luhmann. I mean, if you, if you want to see how a person really thinks about law that does not really change, that's Luhmann. <coughs> At least the way I, I read him. But so part of it is just stability. Second part is institutional order. If the institutional order changes a lot, then of course you, you never get this level of stability. These are the factors that are, well, basically always referred to in sociology of law. There is also the issue of habits. So post-communist societies are usually uh, diagnosed as such as, as having no habit of law abiding. And Poles are really very good at not abiding by the law and we have 200 years tradition of that. And it really can be traced that far. So there might be even a kind of a tradition for not seeing <coughs> law as something coming from heaven, which is also a, part, a negative answer to your question, I guess. So it's tradition. Yes, so I should say tradition. I, uh, habit is a better word because tradition is, uh, a tradition is something that explains why habits arise, I should say. Uh, but um, there are a few more factors like, but these are, I, I, I'm not sure what would be the, the right way of uh, really evaluating them. Factors like participation in lawmaking practices. So it, it's usually claimed that people uh, are able, uh, are more ready to respect the laws when they <coughs> have taken a part in making them. Again, something that is not really very well supported by empirical research, at least in Central and Eastern Europe. And many, many other factors. But basically, I should say that in this logic, stability is the thing. Stability and more or less stable power balances also. Yes. Thank you for a fascinating talk. And thank you for also being the second person today for demonstrating the relevance of two CDBs or over the lines. <laughs> um, I also want to uh, press you a little bit on the last point, which I find very mm -hmm. fascinating, both intellectually and for reasons of personal autobiography. <coughs> autobiographical reason is that as a Greek, we were hoping that bringing Turkey inside the European Union would alleviate the tension between the two yes. countries. Sure. So there was a similar uh, 
the hope about development, which mm -hmm. has not come to fruition. So you say that the countries of uh, Eastern, uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe were coming inside the, the European Union with the hope that we would behave like normal members. Yes. And I do remember that from the time of my studies as an undergraduate. I wonder, with the, all the European Union efforts for socialization, why did that work? And the mm -hmm. policy, the counter-socialization policies, the nationalization policies were more effective because there was an effort to give money, there was an mm -hmm. effort to integrate them <coughs> by giving them positions and state mm -hmm. uh, funding, as well as incorporate them into the symbols of the EU yes. with money and uh, coins and symbols over there. Mm -hmm. oh, with money, this too well. In these two cases, it would be a bit different, but of course, you're very, much very right there. The point about becoming part of Europe as a part of becoming uh, <coughs> members of a community of normal, well-behaving states is also, it's been looked upon for, a, I could recommend the writings of uh, Maria Marksu, uh, who writes about Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lotva, and also Poland and Hungary and other countries which have this problem and sure analyzes the political discourses at the time, so in the 90s, when this, uh, this towards Europe direction was taken by these countries. And well, everybody wanted to get into Europe in the hope that it would work well, so we will become normal. This category of normality really featured a lot. Normality and belonging, so anthropologically speaking. Why it didn't work, again, it's a very large question. And what you are saying is a part of this paradox of Poland and Hungary. So why does this thing happen? Hungary is a bit different, but Poland is a, it really is a very good case. I mean, the countries become richer, more influential, got huge amounts of money, made a huge civilizational leap in all possible, under all possible indices, including uh, like uh, educational indices and uh, uh, GDP and so on. And nevertheless, there is this reaction. So my idea is that this is really, a, you call it, might call it drug effect. Mm. You might just think that it is a reaction, a, a somewhat belated reaction to this period of liberal education. So to the idea that the transformation does not really, is independent of the figuration. The figuration aspect was not really part of the considerations of the design of uh, European <coughs> integration in Central and Eastern Europe. I think so. I was really interested by the, the idea of uh, decivilizing law practices. Mm -hmm. Could you be just elaborate a little more on, on the notion of decivilizing law practices? What mm -hmm. do you mean exactly by this kind of practices? Mm -hmm. uh, you may, uh, first of all, I should say you may uh, make the laws in such a way that instead of words replacing physical struggle, words are used as a sign of physical struggle and physical power relations. If you have uh, parliament, parliament MPs who come to the fore, and we had this in Robert's presentation, there were these quotes from the German parliament, Robert wrote this, yes, you, there you are. You shown this, I think this was an excellent uh, example of what I mean. If you have this uh, uh, vulgar, uh, violent language replacing the standard parliamentary language, for example, and this language translates into lawmaking practices. This language gets, for example, into drafts of statutes, into the grounds for the drafted statutes. And this has happened in Poland. This language of allusion, gossip, and libel <coughs> getting directly into propositions for new laws to be passed. Then it is a decivilizing legal practice, I, I, I should say. This would be just one example of what I mean by that. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure lawyers would think it's still law. Um, law is supposed to, to be an instrument for pacification of society and to find solutions to conflict. So I'm not sure if, yes, it, if that's we had lawyers in the room, obviously we don't. Oh, I'm uh, not. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> except for you, of course. Uh, maybe the, the they would be mm -hmm. really interested by the, the, the proposition. Yes, that's of course, uh, th that is a question of uh, in how far this kind of law, there is this discussion amongst the lawyer, there is the thing called Verfassungsblock. And the lawyers from many countries, including, for example, Kim Scheppel and uh, the people who really have no personal interest, so to say, no the direct interest 
in this problematic are really discussing whether there is it is still law or it's no longer law which is happening in Poland, whether these things really do deserve uh, the name of the law. It's really Radbruch ever again, of course, in mutatis mutandis, because the circumstances are very different and the, uh, the situation does not also really give rise to the concerns of the kind that Radbruch had. But the very idea that some forms of lawmaking and application of law are not, are not, should not really be referred to as law because it only makes matters obscure has been present. So your, your, your point is well made, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. so maybe a really last short questions. Yeah, I, I was wondering whether the long tradition of Poland as a problematic state constantly being dominated by foreign states may have led to this not really obeying the law because the law was often in the hand of foreigners. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very, very good question, and of course, um, I have, um, I have uh, addressed this issue expressly with, in a paper written with a friend uh, of mine, with Daniel Witte, on the effect of constitutions, and the fact that Poland had really many constitutions, at least as as many as five, but none of them was really like a normal constitution passed within a country and taken in effect in the very same country and this country being a nation state in the Iliasian sense is certainly a major contribution to the fact that none of these laws were ever taken very seriously. And the laws are not taken very seriously not only in the field of constitutional law but also in many other fields. There is really a strong uh, suggestion of a national habitus behind that. And this would, of course, be well explained in terms of never having been a real state society. Yes, which may also explain why they may be reluctant to accept European law, because there we go again. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but they also, I think, pin a lot of hope on the United States for defending them against Russia. So is this dual, yeah. I think, orientation in Poland, one towards perhaps the European Union, one towards mm -hmm. the United States, which doesn't exactly help integration. It doesn't help integration and the point about the European law being a foreign law, um, a law made in Brussels, a law made in, in abroad by foreigners and by class traitors of Polish society has been raised frequently in recent years. So this is really, uh, that's again, that's a very good observation. Yeah. So I think we have to stop here. Uh, so we will now listen to the, the, the second speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, can everyone hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Ah, yes. Fine. So, I start with the problem. For a period of roughly four centuries, from 1526 to 1918, the Habsburg monarchy was a major power center within the European system of states. Its final failure to survive in the warlike state competition has created a security vacuum persisting in Europe until today. Trying to find answers for the causes of the Habsburg monarchy's downfall, historians and historical sociologists alike have developed a bundle of highly divergent theories. It is conventionally agreed that Austria's period of successful military great power expansion was relatively short. In the beginning of the 20th century, the monarchy was seen as a living anachronism in a world of ambitious nation states. A hundred years later, the situation of Europe within global state competition is mirror inverted. Now there exists a supranational structure comprising European nation states, which are economically intensely interwoven. The survival unit of the nation state seems to give way to a new, higher level survival unit, Europe. Will it really be able to survive or to enhance the chances of survival for its citizens? Can the European Union be expected to cope with severe crises efficiently and at the same time democratically? Can we learn in this respect something by comparing today's multinational Europe with yesterday's multinational Austria-Hungary? The argument of this talk unfolds in four steps. Please look at the table. First, I will sketch explanations for the downfall of the Habsburg monarchy. Second, I will then discuss the prolonged history of hesitation and failure that characterizes Austria's war record in great power rivalry. Third, I will shift the focus to Europe's history of integration after World War II 
and to the survival function of the <coughs> European Union in terms of its ability to act as a truly supranational entity. Fourth, I will finally address the paradox that the big crisis demanding determined political action of the European Union as a survival unit, for instance the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, the credit crunch of 2008, and the refugee crisis of 2015, that they all affect national sentiments and interests that threaten to disintegrate the Union to the point of disruption. Comparing the situation with that of the Danube monarchy at the turn of the 20th century, the remedy of parliamentarization might easily bring the opposite of a cure. The broad catch-all parties of the European Parliament would turn into particularistic parties narrowly defined according to national interests. I start now with the explanations for the downfall of the Habsburg monarchy. Before the demise of the Habsburg Empire can be discussed, it seems necessary to turn first to its formation. The territory that was later to give rise to the Habsburg monarchy of 1526 was inhabited by ethnic Germans, Hungarians and Slavs right from the start. Its medieval origins lie partly in the same feudal knockout competition that can be observed elsewhere in Western Europe, <coughs> but partly also under the particular influence of the onrush of Eastern nomadic peoples like the Avars, the Magyars or later the Turks. Internal state formation in Central Europe can be roughly described as following four steps as I developed in a book of 2007. We have manorial absolutism based on the feudal authority over unarmed peasants. We have then the stage of courtly absolutism as the product of the victory of prince and emperor over the aristocratic rivals, accompanied by see confessional absolutism occurring with Catholic counter-reformation, securing the administrative and disciplinary power of the church. And finally, we have reform absolutism based on an alliance of the crown with bureaucrats, with the working middle class and the peasantry against the nobility. The first really effective and modern state of Austria was to rise from the pressures of the real danger of annihilation of the Habsburg monarchy after 1740, when Frederick II from Prussia, France, Saxony and Bavaria simultaneously attacked Maria Theresa. Enlightened despotism, or as Austrians call it, enlightened absolutism, meant a strengthening of administrative power, centralization, of administration, create, creating a uniform police, taxation of the aristocracy, reorganization and enlargement of the army, secularization, reformation of censorship and so on. These administrative reforms created, somewhat belatedly, a real state. Bohemia and Austria proper were united. Hungary, which had never been part of the Holy Roman Empire, was a different case. Explanations now for Austrian's final collapse can be grouped into two differing main approaches. For those who stress the importance of geopolitical constraints, military strength is indeed the decisive factor. For Kennedy and Mearsheimer, for instance, the army was important, but, not, but the monarchy, surrounded by more determined enemies, was economically too weak to be a serious contender. Also, it was overstretched, possibly, at least in the 19th century. For an author like Dominic Lieven, military success was also decisive, but he directed his attention to the centrifugal forces that led, for instance, Hungary to a policy to sabotage all attempts to provide the financial means necessary to sustain a credible, common Austro-Hungarian great power army. A second edition stresses rather the internal dynamics of the monarchy. Here we can again distinguish two conflicting interpretations. For one school of thinking, emphasis is mainly laid on the internal power dynamics between different classes and ethnic groups. Here, Austria was often treated as a case of Eastern absolutism, for instance, in the writings of Perry Anderson. Authors like A.J.B. Taylor, Eric Hobsbawm, Ernest Gellner, 
they all saw the struggle of the nationalities or better the German and Hungarian hegemony as decisive for Austria-Hungary's downfall. A different perspective is taken by Judson in a most recent book who refutes the telos of the nation-state as a perspective adopted by opponents, defeated and nationalistic successors of the Habsburg monarchy alike. Contrarywise to conventional judgment, both dynasty and citizens had in his view formed one of the most successful liberal, minority-friendly and pluralistic Im empires imaginable. One could say an early European Union. State formation was not only something affected from above, but also partly from below. But what with the catastrophe of World War I and the apparently easy dissolution in the year 1918? Here he blames, in a similar way like uh, Michael Mann, for instance, does the officer caste, which tried to impose the, disi the disciplinary authoritarian worldview shaped by the backwards looking, looking mentality of a beleaguered, privileged sustaining group within a rapidly changing environment. <coughs> Judson accepts that there are also geopolitical aspects to consider, but he does not think that the strong fears of encirclement experienced and expressed by leading Austrian officers were justified. But as one can say against this assumption, the man forming a reformist military elite thought that it was just Austrian weakness that would encourage Habsburg's enemies and they might have had indeed a point. We have thus at least two conflicting narratives for the causes of the dissolution of the dual monarchy. Which one is right? Or is it possible to combine them, allowing thus also to draw analogies for the Europe of today? I come now to the lost battles, the sad history of the Habsburg armies, history of uh, 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 hesitation of, uh, 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 and failure. Uh, Austria's great power status was a result of the victory over the Ottoman Empire at the turn of the 18th century. The slow decline of Austrian greatness lasted two centuries though. In the wars against Prussia, 1740 to 1763, against France, 1792 to 1815, France, 1859, Prussia again, 1866, and the Entente powers, 1914 to 1918, Austrian armies even enjoyed time and again the advantage of a substantial numerical superiority over their opponents, at least in some decisive battles. Why did they also often end in defeat? Although the, uh, the Habsburg army was reformed after every defeat, bringing forth also changes in principles and strategies of the conduct of war, its prime character never changed. It was defensive, slow, undecided, hesitating throughout the centuries. Education, training, logistics and organization certainly played their role. But these factors alone cannot explain the extraordinary stability of this trade. Even when centrifugal estate dominance was slowly replaced by patrimonial bureaucracy, things did not improve. The latter met now with centrifugal national resistance, and this bureaucracy <coughs> turned into the enemy of all attempts to provide sufficient money for an army of a great power. The result was a quite specific Habsburg military habitus culminating in defeat in World War I. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the result of, of my study uh, uh, on, on the First World War, and I've edited a, a written a book about this with my colleague Sabine Haring. A good example for the particular difficulties Austria faced if it tried to conduct a more active foreign policy, not shying away from war if that seemed necessary, is the case of the French-Prussian War 1870-71. The representative of the International Relations School of Offensive Realism, Mearsheimer, was puzzled that Austria, just beaten in Königgrätz, did not seek revenge by forming a coalition with the belligerent France against Prussia. How was it possible that this probably last opportunity was missed to regain the great power status lost against Prussia 
and to block her ascendancy to absolute dominance in Germany. And to prevent later dissolution of the multinational Habsburg Empire that was seen indeed as a looming danger in leading circles of the monarchy. The historian Lackey gave a detailed reconstruction of the critical moments in summer 1870, helping to see things more clearly. Here was a complex polygon of persons, groups and interests with structural recurring constraints of Austrian politics that had already shaped a habitualized inability to make risky decisions in due time. The more Habsburg society became functionally democratized in Elias' sense of the term, the more difficult was it now to keep up its great power status. Loyalty towards empire and emperor contrasted often, although not always, with the wee feelings of Germans, Hungarians, Slavs, Romanians and Italians that included parts of their nations under the umbrella of foreign states. Only the growing number of workers made themselves felt as a potentially loyal force in the first elections according to the new electoral law allowing, allowing the franchise to all male citizens aged 24 or more for the Austrian half of the monarchy. But after the election in the year 1907, even the 87 social democratic MPs were split into 49 of German orientation who took part in an own German speaking club in the Reichsrat, while the others were also members of clubs according to national, largely Czech affiliation. 66 German Christlich Soziale and 30 Katholisch Konservative formed the faction of 96. But there were also, as you see, 82 Czechs, 79 German nationalists, 61 Poles, 37 South Slavs, 30 Ruthenians and 14 Italians. Already the previous tolerant policy of Count Tafe, head of the government from 1879 to 1893, had aimed at keeping all groups in a kind of sufferable discontent. This did not change. From today's European hindsight, ancient Austria seems here to be the true precursor of modern Europe and equally half democratic. When Austria in the year 1914 went to World War I, it finally proved to be impossible for her to escape from an alliance with a bellicose nation state that opted for the continuation of the war without respect for the centrifugal tendencies in its ally. Slowly, with quiet determination, the Austrian army had marched into its last war. I come now to Europe's history of integration after World War II. In his essays on changes in the VI balance, Elias developed his concept of a survival unit in accordance with his process sociological understanding by outlining three hierarchic dimensions of survival. First, Elias lists the needs for physical safety, always endangered by war or natural disasters, which is the core of the survival function. Second, he underlines the capability to act as a collective in order to persist in military, economic and scientific competition. Third, he mentions the function a survival unit has for securing continuity and tradition in the memory of coming generations. In the case of European unification, Elias saw three different options for a new stage of integration in face of geopolitical competition between the superpowers of the USA and the Soviet Union and also rising new great powers in the making like China and India. He saw the possibi possibility of Europe as a satellite of the United States, Europe as a federation of states or a multilingual federal state, or Europe as the status quo of unconnected nation states. These different layers of the survival function correspond to equally differing forces that shape we feelings, we images, we eye balances, forms of national habitus and we identities. How do these possibilities figure in concrete historical sociological explanations? The political process tying together sovereign states, which call themselves now a European Union, 
has become so familiar and trivial that the question for its causes has ceased to be asked. For many, Europe had to come together simply because it is a project of or for peace. Critics of the European Union may then soon turn out to appear as peacebreakers. But what about the truth behind this theory? Perry Anderson's essay on the origins of European integration, written in the year 1995 and published as a first chapter on his book on the subject in 2009, starts exactly with this question. A quite interesting finding is that many theories he scrutinizes do not deal with the survival aspect of a European superstate at all. They focus rather on the economy, and here they deal less with the advantages European unity brings in competition with other large survival units, but more with the recipro reciprocal benefits European nation states enjoy by opening their markets. It seems that Elias' first option for the development of European unity, Europe as an American satellite, is in the eyes of most observers either regarded as too painful to deal with or too trivial to bother. But it was the American pillar of the global bipolar control of violence that complemented European economic integration right from the start. The continuation of this division of labor is postulated by leading US strategic advisors until today. This seems to work quite well except if it happens that the U.S. Co cause turmoil in the neighborhood and European states have to clean up the mess. Written 2008, Anderson's own judgment of the further European integration step, Maastricht, Amsterdam, Nice, Lisbon and so on, but before the financial crisis caused by the bursting of the American subprime bubble 2008, contains three main theses. Geopolitically, the dynamics of expansion after the collapse of the Soviet Union has brought a huge shift in the power balance between Europe and the US in favor of the latter. NATO dictated the speed and volume of the Eastern expansion. Economically, the trend towards a more federal union and a common currency administered by a so-called unpolitical European Central Bank, which Anderson had also described in his essay from 1995, strengthened the power of the market. Liberalization and privatization, especially in the East, amounted to a true triumph of capitalism and weakened the power both of state and suprastate, as Hayek had in the year 1939 already prophetically predicted. In terms of the development of the power balance between elites and the masses, who, in particular in Southern Europe, suffered most from growing neoliberal unemployment, Anderson sees a sharpening of the divide in chances of participation both of the lower classes in the eastern and southern states, but also between a losing France and a winning Germany. Some German commentators, though, like the economist Hans-Werner Sinn, fear the exact opposite. If one compares now European unification with what we know about the Habsburg's monarchy's process of state formation, there are important differences, but also some commonalities. One difference lies in the fact that the pressure of military state competition with the wars with Ru Prussia and so on, had also led in the 18th century to the transformation of Austria into real statehood with the creation of a great power army. Loyalty towards dynasty and empire was strengthened by the hereditary charisma of the emperor, another factor that is not available in today's Europe. And Europe has an even more complex body of governance than a monarchy. There is a European Commission which functions both as supreme executive organ and also <coughs> legislator whose members are sent there by the nation states. Its budget represents only roughly 1% of the European GDP, is not the result of direct taxation, and a large share of it still goes to agriculture. As Anderson maintains, the European Council of Ministers and the European Council of the Heads of Governments are arcane bodies of intergovernmental politics, little controlled by a European public sphere. 
the European Court of Justice watches over a fictitious constitution with judges sent by the states delivering judgments in procedures lacking transparency. Today's European Union decided in a Treaty of Lisbon to cooperate more closely in terms of a common foreign and securi security policy. Arguably, the wars in collapsing Yugoslavia and in the Middle East contributed to its formulation. In terms of international law, these regulations do still not constitute the status of a military alliance, unlike NATO, since their limitations hollow out the mutual defense clause even in the case of armed aggression from outside, and this clause does certainly not replace NATO. What now have ancient Austria and modern Europe in common? In some respect, the European Parliament lacks real power and acts largely ceremonially, not completely unlike diverse consulting bodies of the dual monarchy. Both can be seen as quite successful economic modernizers. The monarchy was as multinational as Europe is, and both can be dealt with as lacking sufficient democratic control from below. Habsburg Austria has finally failed to be a great power. Europe is not sure that it aspires to be one. And under the aspect of democratic control, Europe is now being advised to become a European Republic with a real parliament and centralized government. But as will soon be clear, this Republic would meet with some of the same centrifugal national forces preventing efficient politics like in old Austria. Sometimes even the national actors are the same when we hear of Hungarian or Czech resistance to European burden sharing or a new wave of authoritarianism in other countries of the vanished Habsburg world. I come now finally to the EU's big crisis demanding determined political action of the U.S. survival unit. Soon after Anderson had completed his book on Europe, several crises shattered trust into the EU's ability to cope with them thoroughly. The global savings and loan meltdown of 2008 and the refugee crisis of 2015, which is still there. But already before 2008, the limits of European politics to influence the even more survival-related survival wars in the Balkans, in Croatia, Bosnia, with Serbia, and in the Middle East, had become visible. And before the refugee crisis of 2015, the topic of migration had also turned long ago into a toxic issue, here as migration flow from east to west and south to north within Europe. The last two decades saw not quite surprisingly, a substantial rise of nationalist and or authoritarian political movements or parties throughout most of the Union. From the 49.2% of Fidesz, so I've, I've put first Brexit with the 52%, um, uh, then for the nearly 38% uh, for the party, for, for the PIS in Poland, 26% for the FPÖ in Austria, the 21% for the Danish People Party in Denmark, to the 13% uh, percent for the Front National in France, and the roughly 13% for rightist parties in the Netherlands and Sweden, and in the last election saw uh, them rise to 17.5%. And last but not least, the triumph for Brexit in Britain. The message is clear. The landslide towards nationalist parties affected also the European Parliament, where they are represented in growing numbers, but mostly still hide under the umbrella of the larger factions. As will be visible, the EU has not only had great problems to decide and act as a truly supranational unit, but every attempt of central crisis solution has met with ever greater resistance, first of nation states and second of their electorates. First, the geopolitical external side of European, uh, of European unification was in particular way touched when it came to the bloody dissolution of Yugoslavia beginning with the secession of Slovenia in 1991. Here the formulation of a consistent and uniform European policy could never be achieved. 
the struggle since the Bosnian war increasingly bitter with British and French newspapers falling sometimes back into, into the rhetoric of 1914 could not be resolved until the US intervened both by military and diplomatic means. Here European indecision was resulting from a, con from a conflict that looks familiar when we compare it with the situation of the late monarchy. It is easy to see that the European Parliament with real powers could have presented a stage for the demonstration of overwhelming national passions, but the idea that it could have helped to formulate a coherent policy was less likely to be realized than a regression to the emotions of the former feuds of the last century. Another dimension of the survival unit Europe was touched when, uh, uh, when in the year 2008 the US housing bubble burst. It became soon clear that the European banking sector was even more affected by it than America itself. European sovereign debt turned into the new subprime with countries like Greece, Ireland, Italy, Spain and Portugal, which were called the so-called peaks states, an acronym with scarcely hidden insult, suffering most. The following austerity policy led to youth unemployment rates of 50% and more in countries like Greece or Spain. As soon as it were no longer anonymous market forces, but identifiable subjects and peoples that could be sorted out to address, Cartoons appeared portraying the German Chancellor Angela Merkel with a Hitler-styled moustache and articles appeared distributing Greek and Polish demands for war reparations amounting to a trillion of euros. Bills and wishes like these will, became, will become matters of routine. If discussed in the real European Parliament, the publicity such utterances would get can scarcely be exaggerated. Democracy may be served peace between states possibly less. These quarrels are well suited to surpass the passions of the Ausgleich negotiations held every decade <coughs> between Austria and Hung Hungary since 1867 dramatically. Finally, the European consequences of the refugee crisis that has started 2015 might be even more fateful for the cohesion of the Union. A common European distribution system for refugees has apparently failed, in spite of some arguments for it. The discussion had led so far to entrenched positions, for instance, of the so-called Visegrad states, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Poland, but also other states proved to be quite unwilling. These must certainly also be linked to the simultaneity of mass migration and the cutthroat competition at the workplace experienced by parts of the lower classes when capital but also labor becomes mobile. It est transgresses border. When, for instance, the formerly British, now American chocolate producer Cadbury moved into a special economic area in Poland with long-lasting tax exemption and European money being guaranteed, not only were loyal English workers fired and joined the Brexit movement, but the Polish workers were pay paid only a small fraction of the English wages and remained without a permanent contract. That's ha that means they could be fired any time. The corresponding we feelings profited also from the remembrance of the danger from Germany and Russia, which had indeed tried in the past to extinguish both Polish identity and Poland herself. Grief, mourning and resentment are thus companions of a simple economic procedure of moving capital and labor from A to B. Even if the hopes of British and po Polish employees thoroughly rejected as guest workers in Britain as they also were for support from their own state are exaggerated, it is still more realistic to assume that help will come from the nation state rather than from the European Union which is light years away from any social union, not least because inner European inequality is only slightly smaller than global inequality. It was Ernest Gellner who once formulated the wrong address theory favored by Marxism. Like Shiite Muslims who thought that the ar ar archangel Gabriel had erroneously delivered his message to Muhammad instead to Ali, Marxists suppose a terrible postal error for the delivery of the revolutionary message, intended to go to classes, 
and instead arriving at nations. As the Austrian theoreticians of the national questions well knew, Bauer, for instance, Bernhard Sieg, Renner, the national question of the turn of the 20th century was as much a product of the modern forces of mass mobilization for the market as a product of the past. The Habsburg monarchy paid for it dearly, not only because of the dark forces it unleashed, but also by a more trivial reason. Like the European Union of today, it inspired, but did not manage to be really democratic. The more democratic it wanted to be, the more it risked immobilism and finally, by the attempt to overcome it, failure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We now have around about tw uh, 10 minutes for, for questions, if you want to. Yes, first one. Thank you very much indeed, Helmut, for giving us such a cogent long-term look at uh, European integration, which gives us uh, a much better understanding, I think, perspective on you know the problems that have gone on in Europe and how those have resulted in the list of votes that you put up there which are horrendous. I mean, you actually missed out the two biggest yeah. in terms of populist reactions because you haven't got the Italian and German results up there, yeah. which obviously would only add to the strength of your argument. Yeah. But I think, you know, so many academics at the moment seem to be locked into the idea that uh, the nationalist response is a tragedy. Well, yes, it is. So as World War One was a tragedy. But uh, it's also understandable, given the context. And I, I thank you very much for having yeah. provided us with some of that. Yeah, I think the situation uh, resembles a tragedy. So um, there is no good solution inside. So simply. So I have yes. one question here. Yeah, can I ask you a historical question? Uh, I've been interested for, for quite a while in the Hispanic world, and also the Hispanic world, Habsburg Spain and its overseas possessions, were at a certain point part of the Habsburg Empire. Yeah. And uh, actually, the territory dwarfed all the rest at a certain point. At a certain point it split apart yeah. and then the rest remained with what you discussed. So I wonder what your analysis, what you would have to add to your analysis, perhaps taking into account that part of, ha of the Habsburg. Spain. Empire. Spain and its overseas possessions. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, the problem is that you can uh, 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 see that the competition between survival units also a competition uh, uh, between dynasties and dynast dynastic, dynastic networks. And the Habsburgs were a dynastic network. Uh, there were so many electors in Germany, for instance, were bribed uh, to vote for, the, for, 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 for a German emperor of Habsburg origin and so on. And <coughs> so, th so this is Ex essentially then the history of the Habsburg family and its extended network. When it becomes, uh, 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 when the history becomes real Austria, and I think Austria only developed under the reign of uh, Maria Theresa, because before that the, the army was an imperial army, a kaiserliche army, then it became an Austrian army. So I would say state formation occurred, e e Austrian state formation uh, 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 took place in, in the 18th century as a reaction to Prussia. But of course you're right that the Spanish problem is also, was also there. For instance, Belgium was from 1318 to 1815 part of Austria, which is uh, <laughs> quite nice to see here. <coughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, fi I find it, I find it striking that there's a, that there's a, that there's a huge, di huge difference. We have the commonality, several nations, several nation nationalities, and so on. Uh, the, the building of a supranational entity, but in the, in case one, it was the war, and, and it formed a survival unit with an army. In the second case, uh, the, the, the 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 military pillar was the U.S. and the and, and, and the Europeans only concentrated on the economic advantages. So this is, 
uh, and this this is irreducible somehow, and <coughs> this is uh, uh, a, a, a dilemma. This this makes it very d different. What what uh, the similarity it gets is that we are equally uh, uh, helpless against the undemocratic aspects of this kind of financial <coughs> capitalism we are suffer under, and this makes us uh, here we have the same kind of lack of democracy than we have against the authorita authoritarian, feudal, bureaucratic mode of Habsburg rule, you know. So <coughs> this is, th here we have, uh, we have against, again, this commonality. So. You think that if we lose the military support from the US, this would uh, uh, change us or maybe destroy the European integration? This is the fascinating aspect that European integration really started with the market and, it, and, it, and, and in, in, in uh, 1987, then with a the single European act, it became even more so. so and it, 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 there was a determination then to go strictly uh, the path to, uh, through market integration. And this, is of, this was, a, was a decision. And it, 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 and, and it happened that way. And now we have to live with the consequences. I do not know how to overcome this. So no idea. <coughs> yes. Thank you for a fascinating uh, longer <coughs> explanation of our conundrums. <coughs> Your presentation reminded me of uh, things that uh, Rousseau and Locke also tried to grapple. But in terms of education, which education is more effective, authoritarian or more democratic? Because here, the issue, especially in the end, you made it clear, it's about the vitality of Europe. You said that the more it increases its democratic style, it is less effective, less vital, more defeatist, more ineffective to tackle its challenges. So it seems like there is a perennial question which we seem to be uh, failing to, to address in our world today. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, is that inescapable to democratization to lead to these types of failure and lack of vitality that reminds me of uh, Spengler of the early 20th century? I don't want to be the Spangler <laughs> of the <laughs> 21st century. I'm not, not, I'm not personally pessimistic, you know, it's not my, my attitude uh, in, 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 uh, uh, towards life. But uh, of course I see a problem, because the, the more you try to parliamentarize, the more you, uh, 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 the, the, the sentiment of nationalism arises, and it ca this cannot be prevented. The Austrian example is so strong in this respect. Uh, <coughs> That uh, uh, you have to follow. I mean, the struggle of nationalities in the Austrian uh, part of the monarchy uh, is really the, the the mother of all battles of nationalities. <laughs> the mother of all battles. You can, if, if you study this, you you get a you get a good, very good picture. What what are the obstacles to 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 to, to and and it only could be somehow settled not by the Demo Democrats themselves, but by enlightened. Uh, political elites in the, in the administration. Austria was always led more by high bureaucrats than by politicians, to its, probably to its, uh, to its advantage. <coughs> it was, uh, it is not satisfying for us, uh, of course, yes, but. Okay. <coughs> so maybe the last question. Yeah, again, I just want to say that, that was a fantastic talk. Um, <coughs> could you you led quite heavily, uh, and maybe I wasn't clear here, on Perry Anderson's work, of course, yeah. from a very Marxist perspective. On yeah. thing. <coughs> does, that, does that run across an Elysian perspective, or do you think that the two are compatible? Um, or did you find any problems in his work? That way? Yeah, Perry Anderson's work on, on, on this very early work on, yeah. on, on, on uh, from feudalism to absolutism and so on, yeah. it, it, it is a compromise, I think. It is yeah. essentially in its, its core, it's Marxist in dealing largely with economic uh, yeah. uh, forms of domination, but it has also some side remarks on uh, state competition. Yeah. Uh, when I read the book about the European Union, I, th I thought, uh, and it came to me that he has learned a bit, and that, that he now uh, 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 re respects geolo geopolitical pressures more than he did in, in, in 74, I think. <coughs> it's ironic because he actually shifts position. He's actually pro Europe in the 1990s yeah. and in the 2000s. So he's, again the ga he's again a bit skeptical now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay.
Uh, thank you, thank you. I think it's time to, to thanks again both our speakers. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Buchholz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.